Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato. I want to talk about this interview with Pat Metheny, conducted by Rick Beato. Now you owe it to yourself to watch this whole interview if you haven't seen it already on Rick's YouTube channel, and I'll link to it in the description. As an interview subject, Pat Metheny exudes fierce dedication to his craft, and he is deeply thoughtful and articulate. As an interviewer, Rick Beato combines a very broad knowledge base of his own with the enthusiasm of a die-hard Pat Metheny fan. As one person said in the comments, it's as if Rick has been preparing for this interview his whole life. Hi, everybody. I'm Chase Sanborn, and on this channel I share things that I've learned in more than 40 years as a jazz trumpet player. I assigned my university students to watch the interview, and then we devoted a whole class to discussing it. Now, I don't think I've taught a class since where I haven't made reference to it. Pat speaks with a clarity of vision and the credibility that comes with his position as one of the musical giants of our day. He's driven to innovate, and he describes a work ethic that not many of us can match, but it's something from which we can all draw inspiration. I've watched the whole interview three times, and from it, I've gleaned 10 key points that I can connect and compare to my own thoughts as a musician and as a teacher. I've called them rules, but true to form, Pat frames them more as guiding principles for his own life rather than something he prescribes for others. Number 10. Find out how the music you love works. Now, this line actually comes towards the end of the interview, and to me, it goes to the heart of what we do and why we do it. We became musicians because we love the sound of music, so much so that we want to figure out how to create those sounds ourselves. Now, this is a motivating force, but it's also a daunting task. Learning to play music at a professional level is a lot of work, let alone to reach the status of innovator. Throughout the interview, Pat makes it clear that he's no exception in that regard. In his words, it's not effortless. It may sound like that, but I've spent a lifetime trying to get to the point that I can just be. So this is sort of a Zen concept, that one spends hours in the practice room trying to figure out how music works just so that we can forget all that and simply be in the moment at the moment. I guess you could say that you have to work hard in order for listeners not to realize how hard you worked. Number nine, approach your first album as if it will be your only album. Pat credits his mentor, Gary Burton, with this bit of advice, as he does with others on this list. When Pat was offered the opportunity to record his first album, Gary cautioned him not to be impetuous, to make sure that the record would stand as a testament, even if it was the only record he ever made. In listening to Pat's tunes, Gary stopped when he heard Bright Size Life, saying, I know what those other tunes are. I don't know what this is. So that's it. Bright Size Life was the title tune of a debut album which had little impact initially, but it came to be seen as an important cornerstone in the career of a highly influential artist. Now, you could compare that to the first decade or so of Thelonious Monk's career, when few people were able to recognize the impact that he would ultimately have on the evolution of the music. The lesson can be more broadly interpreted as well. Youth comes with a temptation to rush headlong, and while we don't want to squelch that drive entirely, one does well at any age to realize that we don't yet know what we don't know. While we do eventually want to leap, it's never a bad idea to look. Number eight, don't cast a band in your image. When Pat was offered the opportunity to record for ECM, he immediately thought of playing with some of the older and more established stars on the label. Gary questioned why he would want to do that when Pat had a great young band, which included an unknown Jocko Pastorius. Those musicians already knew his music, and more importantly, they had the potential, like Pat, to bring new sounds of their own to the world. The main point is that you want to surround yourself with musicians who will complement your musical vision, but not reflect it. The best collaborations come from people who think differently. Number seven, a good tune must be a robust vehicle for improvisation. Pat lists his priorities as music first, band leader second, and himself third. He accepts his responsibility as a composer to write tunes that will inspire other musicians. He says he has to write 10 tunes in order to get three that musicians will want to play night after night. He mentions Thelonious Monk as the gold standard. Monk only wrote about 70 tunes, but he's on par with Duke Ellington as one of the most often recorded jazz composers. Now, it's one thing to write a melody and chords that sound good together. It's another to craft a robust framework for improvisation, to use Pat's words. I've played enough student compositions to know that writing good blowing changes is not a skill that's acquired overnight, and it's made all the more elusive by the young writer's desire to be innovative, sometimes to the detriment of the music. It's such a fine line between stupid and, and clever. Yeah, it's just a little turnabout. 
Number six, show people the changes. The full quote is this. The idea is to show people the changes. Look how cool it is when this note changes to that note. I'm always looking for the places in the chords where the activity that moves the chords along is happening. Now, Pat says that people tend to think that his tunes are easier than they actually are. This speaks to a composer who's able to meld complex ideas into a form that is easy for a listener to comprehend. Now, that's always been one of my barometers for great composition. The two people come to mind in that regard are Wayne Shorter and Antonio Carlos Jobim. How many people have heard Girl from Ipanema while riding an elevator, and how many musicians have been stymied by the bridge on that tune? Pat's quote also speaks to the responsibility of a performer to help a listener comprehend the music and therefore appreciate the beauty that lies within. In my own pedagogy, I use the term pivotal tones to describe notes that form the sharp corners of the harmonic progression. When the improviser targets these notes, and there often aren't that many of them, the navigation of the chords will be heard as skillful. I also use the analogy of a spotlight to describe the way that certain notes will impact the perception of a chord. When you're able to pinpoint key elements of a chord and then find a logical melodic path from that chord to the next chord, what we might call guide tone lines, you help the listener hear what's going on. You could call this the musical equivalent of a guided tour at a museum or an art gallery. Pat says, the first thing is to be able to solo using the notes of the chords. If you can't do that, it's not going to be very deep. In other words, if you can't precisely express the harmony, then any attempt to move beyond those boundaries is on shaky footing. Number five, the drummer is the leader of every band. So here, Pat focuses on another of what he memorably terms the three branches of musical government, melody, harmony, and rhythm. He says, It's almost without exception that the guy who wants to talk about playing outside has some work to be done on playing quarter notes. If that's not happening, all that other stuff doesn't mean anything. Feel is everything. As I describe it, melody and harmony determine what your solo sounds like, but rhythm determines what it feels like, and that's why we call it time feel. While on this topic, Rick Beato reinforces the idea that you could play all the theoretically wrong notes, but if your rhythm is solid, it's musically valid. And the opposite is also true. Now, when I floated this supposition to my improv class that the wrong notes played with good time sound better than the right notes played with bad time, one of the students said to him they sound equally bad. Okay, fair enough, but realistically, I think it's unlikely that someone would be rhythmically astute but melodically or harmonically unaware to the point that one would play a bunch of bad-sounding notes with great time. In any case, I agreed that if the music doesn't feel good, it's not going to sound good. Number four, learn all the basic elements, then do something different. Here Pat is speaking from the perspective of someone who feels deeply that his responsibility as an artist is to create something that hasn't been before. But he's also stressing the need to understand everything that has come before as a foundation on which to innovate. Now, John Coltrane spoke similarly when he talked about checking out Sidney Bechet's early work on soprano sax, saying that what Train perceived as new might already have been done. Now, as any teacher knows, having somebody at the level of Pat Metheny reinforce the importance of addressing the basic elements makes it easier for us to convince our own students that they need to do the same. Number three. Music should be like a magic show. In this interview, and in others I've seen, Pat considers the question of whether he's the first new guy or the last old guy. He concludes that he's probably the last old guy, giving as an example that he would never allow anyone in his band to read music on stage because it diminishes the magic of musical creation. To the average person, what we do as jazz musicians is like magic. How is it that we can collectively create a cohesive performance with no visible means of musical organization, like you would see in a symphony orchestra where every musician is reading a part and a conductor keeps it all together? Now, it is absolutely true that a music stand creates a barrier between the musician and the listener. It could be a real visual barrier if it's right in front of you, and I recommend trying to find a position for the music stand where it will be less so. But it also creates a more visceral disconnect when the musician's focus is on a written part, and that's all the more true in the context of improvising. It's a disconnect between the musician and the listener, but also between the musician and the other musicians. Remember that written music is a visual interpretation of sound. Shutting down one sense heightens the others, and a performance will always be more impactful when the musician focuses more on what she hears than what she sees or knows, so that a listener can do the same. 
Number two, be who you are. Gary Burton was drawn to the tune he didn't understand because he saw it as a reflection of a unique and original artist. Now, few of us are going to be as innovative as Gary Burton or Pat Metheny, and it's not essential to create something brand new in order to connect with a listener. But it is essential that your music reflects who you are and what you feel. And if it does, your audience will feel something when they listen to it. And that's the core goal for every artist. And finally, number one, do what you know is good. Duke Ellington once responded to a music critic by saying that people sometimes concern themselves with what an artist should have done rather than what he did. Now, back when I was in university, a peer said something to me that has stuck with me throughout my life. He said that I seemed to have a good read on my own ability or talent, meaning that I was neither overly impressed by what I could do nor overly depressed by what I could not. Now, I was happy to hear that at the time, and I think it's helped me along the way. In the interview, Pat says, I need to work on what I can't do. Now, this is a lesson that many of us have heard. It's tempting to focus on what we can do because trying to do what we can't is discouraging. But owning up to inability and addressing it is the quickest path to improvement. So when a student says to me, I can't do that, I always add the word yet to the end of the sentence. If we uncover a weakness during a lesson, well, that's good. We know what to work on. The trumpeter Jack Sheldon titled his autobiography, Trying to Get Good. That's a concise summation of every musician's life. We all have different versions of what good is, though. Maria Schneider wants to find good music as music that holds her interest. That takes into account that what holds my interest may not hold yours, and that's okay. Bill Evans put it this way, I'm the only one who can say whether I've succeeded. For most of us, success is a matter of degree. I don't know as I've ever met anyone who's entirely satisfied with what they've accomplished, and certainly not a musician. A musician lives with the reality that others are going to judge our efforts in the form of a review, a decision on whether to attend our show, or hire us for a gig. Now, while there are financial ramifications that cannot be ignored, and this is not intended to excuse substandard effort or diminish the reality that some people will achieve on a higher level, if you let other people's opinions influence your own perception of whether what you have done is good, well, that's a recipe for unhappiness. So I say, be your own best critic, but don't be unduly harsh. In the end, all we can do is give it our best effort and live with the results. If you do that, it's good. Hey, thanks for watching. If you found this video helpful, I'd love it if you would take a half a second to click the like button. Here's a couple of suggestions for where to go next.